again. You'll remember that we talked about the three basic structures of children's songs. There was the A, B, well, most sonata form and, and uh, baroque dances fall into this category. We have movement towards the middle, there's a double line in the middle, a repeat, we go back again, and the same happens with the second half of the, of the structure. Then we have A, A, B, A, which is very popular again for structures that repeat the first half, go into a new section and then come back again for a reprise of what we just had. This is the sort of sonata form structure if you don't repeat the second half, which Beethoven usually doesn't. And so that um, we then have the third type of structure again, which a, a type of sonata form, which is a sort of ABA, if you like. And this is the exposition, a development section, and then the recapitulation. Um, which is how some people see sonata form anyway. But this is just one of the forms. It's the type, if you leave out the repeats, it's the type of sonata form that you'll get with uh, overtures, shall we say. So, if we look at Debussy's Prelude, we'll see this is the type of structure he's using. I'm not going to suggest that this was intentionally in sonata form or intentionally in a ternary form. But it certainly has worked out in this way and so just the general architecture, first of all, you'll discover that we have a sort of exposition of, of 30 bars. We have a coda of 30 bars, and this cannot be a coincidence. And in between, we have an enormous section, which we could regard as our B section, if you like, uh, which has 44 bars and goes, moves up to this most incredibly sublime climax, which is by sheer coincidence, right in the middle of this temple, if we want to call it this, this wonderful piece. So let's look at some detail. This is our first theme. Fluctuating between a C-sharp and a G, this is the tritone, or the devil in music, as it used to be called. Here's the second part of this theme and we still really don't know what whatever key we're in. So we get this version of the Tristan chord, as we already discussed it. It resolves in a very unusual way. And then, like in the Tristan prelude, we have this agonizing moment of waiting before we just repeat what we've just done with the harp playing up and down, going up and down this thing to come we repeat this again, and now we have this melody once again, but with some harmony now. This is a sort of D major chord, but it's D major with a major seventh. This is a consonance for jazz musicians, but for Debussy and his contemporaries, it would still have been it would have been a, an awkward type of moment, an awkward appoggiatura. completely different harmonization, and now the A2 as I called it, and then we, we extend this now and we new, introduce a new theme. This is going to be important later on. It ends with a sort of a, oh, what shall we say next? Well, let's go back to our beginning. Now, we already had the D major, as the jazz musicians would call it, D, a major triad with its major seventh, and now we have E with an added sixth. Again, this is, this is very typical jazz harmony, but for Debussy, it's on the border. Is this an appoggiatura? Is it really a chord in its own right? Okay, we don't need to answer that question. It's really both. And come down now to a C major. So this is a composed cadence like this. Now is this a plagal or a perfect cadence? I have no idea. But it's not 5-1. So it must be plagal in some way or other. Alright? And again, we get a fourth version of this uh, with this chord underneath it. Well, this is E7 and 9. 
and then with this C sharp there, well, we might call that an E11 if we wanted to. There's no sign of the A though, so people might dispute that. So, and that is our fourth and last attempt to expose on this one theme, which is, uh, which is our opening, our exposition. This takes us up to bar 30. Now, having modulated to the dominant, we surprise ourselves by going into a French sixth, which has nothing to do with anything at all. Um, whole tone scales, which destroy any sense of tonality we may have had. Now, this I've labelled D2. It's taken from A2, from the beginning. And this we'll call D3. Again, our figures taken from D3, which we then develop in more or less a Beethoven type of way. Obviously with very different harmony, but the type of structure is the sort of thing that, that Beethoven might have done. At this point, we get this variation we've had already on D4. call D5, because it has a newer character, because of this meditative nature closing this little section, at least we think it's going to be a close, but it actually is going to go somewhere else. When we play the harmony complete, we'll see where this has gone, because instead of... on, again, a chord that the jazz harmony would have no problem with, but we're talking about uh, 1894, I think, or about this, certainly the end of the century when this was being written. And this is a chord of A flat major with its major seventh, okay? So, again, we might say, well, this is a cause of dissonance, it will have to be resolved. sense of arrival. For the first time in the whole piece, we've got a clear major triad. No added sixths, no sevenths, no ninths, no elevenths, nothing added to it. And the effect is just incredibly magical and gracious. Well, the next section could perhaps even have been taken out of an operetta from the, of the time. Uh, it's very, very lyrical. The harmonies don't quite do what an operetta ought to do. doing anything other than what that should do, but the melody is very... based on this figure, and of course that's the major version of what we've already had from where we started with our searching for resolutions for this Tristan chord and all its inversions. As this section winds down, this big D-flat major section, we get this little figure. All right, this came up in the introduction again. It was one of the developments of the first theme. And then this whole section closes with more little variations on this. resist going down with this heavy appoggiatory which could almost be an added six and then very sweet this little addition on D flat seven and, and D9 
9, G flat 9. We're back in E major. We've arrived in a very unconventional way, but now we can take a sort of recapitulation of our main theme. Well, we have our E major languishing theme, but it doesn't start from the sixth this time, it starts on the keynote, and the harmony is now in a first inversion. Well, what he's done here is to, just to add a bass note, and turn this E major chord into C sharp minor with a seventh. Now he's going to go down a fifth, and make it F sharp with a sort of 11th chord before he resolves that into C major. And now he can't resist the um, our opportunity to laugh at himself. So instead of saying this awful languishing theme as we first had it, okay, and we've got the schoolgirls giggling away in the distance as well laughing their way at this, and of course we'll get another attempt to say something about this theme. The second version of this figure is almost a direct transposition, just a, a semitone lower. So we've got this sort of Neapolitan relationship, and we're suddenly in E flat major. But we now get the schoolgirls laughing at us now in whole tone scales, and we get a third version of the theme on an E9 chord. This theme will come back to us and haunt us again, because we're getting near something like a coda now. The fourth and last version of the whole theme is starts with C sharp major, C sharp seventh harmony, alternating between A sharp seven and uh, we go into the coda proper, which is something that Gershwin might have been very proud of. Look at this lovely sliding sensual harmony. And it ends almost on that chord, which we had at the very beginning. And we finally get, after so much searching, the resolution Mallarmé was very pleased with what Debussy had made of his poem, and we know the story that the fawn has just woken up from an afternoon sleep, and he's trying to remember what he was dreaming about. Well, given the sensuality and the, and the languid nature of this music, it certainly wasn't a cold day, and I think we can almost imagine what he'd been dreaming about. So that's all for today.